Good morning, I'm Van Rogerson with NC East Alliance. Um, thank you for joining us today for a very interesting topic. I'd like to start off by just thanking our sponsors, if I can just briefly, our platinum sponsors, ECU, Vidant, Integrated Financial Holding, Bull and Associates, and our gold sponsors, Beaufort County, Dominion, uh, Electric Cities, and then also our silver sponsors, Evolve, Martin Marietta, Port of Virginia, Nutrien, Martin County, Kilpatrick, Townsend. Thank you all of our sponsors that helped us um, to move forward. You know, this is an exciting um, discussion for me. I wake up every day and I just do my job. I don't think much about cybersecurity or how things work. I just want stuff to work when I get there. I remember when I first met Keith Wheeler, uh, he had just been hired with ECU. They had got off a conversation with DARPA, I think it was, Keith. Um, but it was about a casino. We never heard this story, but the casino had been robbed. And they got what I consider or think would be the Cadillac of all security systems. Well, they got hacked because they had a fish tank out on the casino floor that was monitoring oxygen and it was sending an unsecure message back to the computer system. Those guys hacked <laughs> the fish tank to get into the system to steal millions of dollars. At that point, I realized, my gosh, what is a guy like me? I mean, what can we possibly do? So um, this is just an exciting subject. Uh, thank you, Keith Wheeler uh, with ECU for um, putting this together, being our moderator. I'm going to turn it over to Trey just a second so he can give you kind of the rules of the road for our Zoom call today. I'm going to quickly try and run through the logistics for today's webinar. First, we will have a Q&A session at the end of the webinar after all the presentations. So try and hold your questions until the end um, during the Q&A session. Uh, but if I if at any point during the presentation you want to go ahead and submit your question, you can click that Q&A box down at the bottom middle, type in your question and submit it, and we'll address it during the Q&A session at the end. If during the Q&A session you'd like to ask a question live, you can click this raise hand icon. I'll unmute you and you can ask your question live. We'll also have the chat box available where you can type your questions there. And there may be um, the speakers or I may share some documents or links um, that will be supplemental to the presentation, so keep an eye out for those. And if at any point you need to adjust your audio settings during the presentations, you can click this audio setting tab in the bottom left and adjust them. Um, if you plan to ask a question live during the Q&A session, you can also check your microphone settings and be sure they are correct there. If at any point you need to change the size of your screen during the webinar, you can click this view options tab in the upper middle and change the size of the screen as needed. You can also click these four arrows in the top right of your screen to enter and exit full screen mode if need be. And that should cover everything. So now I'm going to introduce our moderator for today, Keith Wheeler, former or retired, excuse me, Navy captain, who is the current executive director of Office of National Security and industry initiatives at East Carolina University. So Keith, I'm gonna pass it off to you. Thanks, Trey. Um, yep, good, that, that's a perfect slide right there. So uh, super excited to be with everybody today. Thanks for joining us. Uh, some amazing panelists for you today uh, to share some, uh, some really incredible information on uh, Industry 4.0 and infrastructure cybersecurity. This is our lineup. Um, first leading off is uh, Dr. Harry Plone. He's the Dean of our College of Engineering and Technology. He's going to provide a quick intro on Industry 4.0, pose some critical questions for anyone associated with manufacturing today, and you know, hopefully would like continued success into the future. Additionally, he's going to share some exciting developments that we have happening at ECU and how we hope to leverage those assets for the region. Following Harry will be uh, Mr. Scott Fleming. Scott works at KN, which is a cutting edge facility that manufactures automobile parts up in uh, Edgecombe County. He's the manager of the assembly technical group, and he's gonna share a bit about their operations uh, in production and some, some challenges that 
you know, go into making and adjusting uh, on the assembly line. After Scott, we've got uh, Mr. Stephen Warwick. He's the founder and CEO of Connected Devices, which is located in Chapel Hill. He's a recognized expert in uh, research and development and deployment of uh, 5G systems. And you know, most companies probably don't realize that they can field their own private 5G, 5G systems on site, let alone the importance of deploying 5G over the, the mostly Wi-Fi components that they're probably using today. Uh, and, and the importance of having 5G and realizing the potential of uh, Industry 4.0 initiatives. After Steve, we've got Mr. John Powell. He's, he's a very experienced substation and controls engineer at Greenville Utilities Commission. John's going to address some of the things that a lot of folks take for granted, some of which, you know, uh, uh, Van already mentioned. Uh, you know, a question like how do we deliver the basics like electricity and water to a population 24 seven while keeping up with the ever advancing technology associated with, with controlling those systems and increasingly challenging vulnerabilities of, uh, of that increased connectedness. And last but certainly not least, uh, we have Mr. Matt Zimmerman from all the way down in Florida. He's the CEO and founder of Beast Code. It's a very cool company that's working to revolutionize some of the industrial infrastructure aboard the Navy's warships and how that's how it's managed, monitored, and maintained. Uh, it's amazing to see some of the tools that, that Matt and his team have developed. Uh, I describe them as colliding a collision of tech manuals, system CAD drawings, operation and maintenance procedures, and 3D gaming to deliver some really amazing uh, capabilities, hopefully to our sailors very soon. And having spent decades in the Navy on some of the same warships that, uh, that Matt and Beast Code are, are working to improve, I can tell you this, this, these capabilities can't come fast enough. So with that, I'm gonna be quiet and uh, turn it over to our first panelist, uh, Dean Harry Plone. Take it away. Good morning, everyone. I hope you can see my screen. Yes, Keith says yes, thank you. Good morning, everyone. Uh, let me um, change my view here, good. Well, good morning, everybody, and thank you for the introduction, Keith. Uh, first, uh, let me say I'm not an expert either in cybersecurity or Industry 4.0, but fortunately, we have four other speakers coming after me who are the bona fide experts, and I lead a college with significant faculty expertise in these areas. So I'm here to give you a very brief introduction to Industry 4.0 and tell you about how ECU and our college may be able to help you in the future. laser pointer here first. You know, in school, we all learned about the Industrial Revolution when water and steam powered machines gave birth to industrial manufacturing, but that was really the first in a, a series of industrial revolutions. And the second industrial revolution was uh, the uh, uh, introduction of mass production, assembly lines, and electrification of manufacturing processes. And then the third was the introduction of computer controlled equipment, automation, and robotics. And today we're in the midst of a fourth industrial revolution. And for short, it's called industry 4.0. That's what the 4.0 refers to involving cyber or internet connection of physical manufacturing equipment, which is also known as the industrial internet of things. And so the industrial internet of things represents the convergence of information technology and operations technology as illustrated in, in, for example, in this diagram. Along the bottom of this diagram, you see the usual elements of operations technology in a manufacturing operation, uh, beginning with the supply chain and the delivery of raw materials to a, to a manufacturing location, uh, the discrete steps in a manufacturing process, and then finally the shipping of products to customers. And IT OT convergence entails to begin with the internal networking of individual manufacturing workstations via either hardwired or wireless data networks. And then connection of uh, integration uh, of the manufacturing uh, workstations with uh, the MES, which is the manufacturing execution system, and maybe with the enterprise resource planning system as well. 
And then there's, there's beyond that, uh, the internal connectivity within a, a, a manufacturing site. There's the macro scale connectivity, obviously between customers and a manufacturing site, as well as uh, cloud uh, uh, data storage, possibly, uh, 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 internet connection with partner manufacturing facilities, and then even connectivity up the supply chain. So the digital transformation of manufacturing not only involves this cyber connectivity, both internal and external, but it also creates a huge trove of data that can be harnessed using data science tools like data mining and machine learning and, and AI, artificial intelligence, to drive improvements in productivity, versatility, and sustainability. So the critical questions, you know, if you're involved in manufacturing in any way, whether you're an industry leader or just an, an industry employee of, uh, at, at any level, or if you're involved in economic development, or if you're an educator, you ought to be asking yourself some critical questions. You know, what does the future of manufacturing look like for you? Does it involve digital transformation? The answer to that is probably yes. You know, we're seeing it in higher education, so it's, it's, it's uh, across all kinds of sectors. And then are you ready for that future? And the answer is probably no. Uh, you, you're probably thinking about you know, what are the future workforce needs? You know, and, and am I gonna be able to sub be supplied with the workforce for the future? What are the equipment needs, both the information technology and the manufacturing uh, equipment technology that are gonna be needed for a digitally transformed manufacturing? Where am I gonna find the, the training to be able to upskill and new skill my employees to be able to uh, uh, work in this new world. And then of course, anything that's involving uh, cyber connectivity, uh, one must be worried about the cyber security of that. So uh, I throw up my hands and say, what are you gonna do? Are you gonna try to do it yourself and figure it out? Or are you gonna get help? And, and almost certainly the answer is you're gonna do both. So just for myself in getting started, uh, you, know, you can go out on the internet and find a, a whole range of reports. They're coming out monthly, at least. Uh, I began with this report on uh, uh, Industry 4.0 and discrete manufacturing. Uh, this November 2020 MIT Technology Review is excellent, eight pages on the fourth industrial revolution. I just recently found this one from January of this year on uh, advanced manufacturing using robotics. Um, I'll... I'll uh, 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 put links, Trey has copies of these, or if you watch the recording, you can Google the titles and you can find them in a snap. But this is a, a great way to get started and to begin to understand some of the jargon and some of the concepts to help get your juices flowing on uh, Industry 4.0 and smart manufacturing. But then beyond that, uh, uh, you're, you're certainly going to want to reach out and get help. And that's where ECU comes in. We have a couple of different uh, uh, millennial campus strategic initiatives that I'll tell you briefly about uh, and then uh, 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 go from there. One of them is the Eastern Region Pharma Center, uh, which is focused primarily on pharmaceutical manufacturing. And then there's the Smart Manufacturing and Maintenance Center at Intersect East, which is more focused on traditional discrete manufacturing. First on the Eastern Region Pharma Center, this was recently announced that we won a $1.9 million uh, grant from the Golden Leaf Foundation, and that's being matched with a, about a million dollars of ECU uh, cost sharing to really launch a workforce initiative focused on pharmaceutical manufacturing in the Biopharma Crescent of Eastern North Carolina. The components of this uh, pharma center are on all the areas that I, I hit at before. We're focused on developing in collaboration with our community college and pharma industry partners, uh, uh, basically, if you will, the supply chain for future workforce from K through 12 outreach, uh, 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 making more apparent the degree paths to associates and, and BS degrees, and working on uh, uh, stepping up our game for intensive uh, coaching to help students be aware of the pathways and then be successful as they move along those pathways. There's also a very strong focus on continuing education for incumbent employees. Uh, on the first floor of that life sciences and biotechnology building in Greenville, there is almost 5,000 square feet of laboratory space that will be an equipment test bed for industry projects. We'll be able to do pilot scale uh, uh, pharma manufacturing, exploration of equipment, consult on projects for pilot to production 
uh, rollout. And then overlaid on top of it all will be a cybersecurity, a cyber range for cybersecurity training. And then of course, we're gonna try to provide networking and connections of the human kind uh, in addition to the IT kind, uh, because uh, believe it or not at ECU, we did not know it all. And we need to really help facilitate connections between our regional industry partners and the national and world landscapes in this area. The point I wanna make is that we spent almost 18 months in developing this pharma center with a lot of preliminary uh, industry input. And so now uh, the next big thing is the smart manufacturing and maintenance center uh, that, we're, that we're getting ready to begin development of. It will be physically located in the export leaf building uh, uh, along 10th Street in Greenville. And this is a part of a 19 acre development known as Intersect East. It's a public private partnership between ECU and Elliott Sidewalk communities. And the point that I want to emphasize is that this is, we're in the beginning stages of this and we are really, really hungry for industry input on your workforce needs, continuing education needs and help in developing a 10,000 square foot equipment test bed. In some more detail, that export leaf building is laid out here and uh, there will be a manufacturing pathways program where we'll collaborate across the region with our community college and industry partners to help develop those pathways into the degrees needed by our industry partners. Again, another strong emphasis on continuing education for uh, digital transformation of manufacturing. This 10,000 square foot test bed for pilot projects. And again, another cyber range. And of course, the, the networking and connections to the whole national landscape of uh, smart manufacturing, both at NC State and across the nation. So we have some preliminary plans. We have some ideas about the kinds of equipment that we may want to put into this equipment test bed. We have a preliminary layout. We have uh, uh, ideas about both the cyber range and using AR and VR technology. But uh, really what we're looking for at this point is industry guidance. We really want to deeply understand your workforce needs. We need to understand your continuing education needs and really inform us on the kinds of equipment and space planning for this space that are really gonna be able to help us meet your needs in the future. With that industry guidance, then we're gonna be able to go out and seek grant funding support to really acquire this equipment and to staff up in the personnel we need to be able to deliver the programs in this center. And of course, you know, we're always uh, have our hand out seeking philanthropic support. So even if you're not involved in manufacturing, but if you're a, a big bank or just someone who wants to invest in the future of Greenville and ECU and Eastern North Carolina, we would certainly um, uh, welcome talking to you about generating some support for this endeavor. Now, I, I must also give a shout out to the Intersect East because we're developing this in partnership with Elliott Sidewalk Communities. So we're gonna be located in this corner of the Export Leaf Building, but there's a, a number of other tenant spaces in this building and there seem to be uh, hot properties right now. Greenville ENC Alliance is gonna be located in this building as well. So there's this Export Leaf Building as well as an entire master plan for a 19 acre development. And it's really gonna be transformative for the future of Greenville and for the future of ECU. Uh, it's centrally located along 10th Street in Evans and Evans and the vision for what this place will look like, both the buildings that are gonna be constructed and, and the open spaces, the restaurants, uh, the amenities, it's gonna be a very uh, uh, enjoyable community to work in. So I would give that a shout out. So you know, we would invite you to participate with us, of course, in the development of our 10,000 square foot equipment test bed and the Smart Manufacturing and Maintenance Center. But if your vision is bigger and if you'd like to think about uh, another, another location to work on innovation on a larger scale and you need more square footage, Elliott Sidewalk Communities is interested in talking to you. So contact me or uh, go, to their, go to the website uh, that I show you here or you know, contact me if you can spell my last name or Google it, you can find me. Uh, please feel free to email me. Also, Scott Sneed is our Director of Industry Relations. You can find us on Facebook, you can find us on LinkedIn. So uh, we would be happy to talk to you. Email me and I will help you get connected and ensure that uh, you're able to work with us for the future of uh, smart manufacturing and maintenance um, in, in the region. So with that, I will stop. 12 minutes, not bad. Um, Happy to turn it over to you, uh, uh, Trey or Keith.
Yep, I'll take it, Harry. Thank you uh, very much. A uh, lot of information there. Hopefully, uh, we'll we'll get some callbacks and some follow ups. Uh, happy to join in on any of those conversations. Uh, just was contacted a few minutes ago by uh, Scott Fleming, and he's dealing with an issue uh, that's going to prevent him from uh, from being our next speaker. He might make it towards the end, so uh, we're going to fast forward a bit, and you know. I, I wanted real life people talking about real life issues on, you know, infrastructure and uh, cyber and industry 4.0. And that's what you get. You get conflicts in the facility uh, where, you know, they're kind of preempted. So we're going to go to uh, Stephen next, if he's ready. Hey there, can you hear me? Okay, let me uh, share my screen as well. And we'll just go ahead and get this started. Let's see. All right, can you see this? All right, uh, you can see the presentation, I'm presuming. For, variety, for what, if some reason, I cannot tell there. All right, maybe that'll be helpful. All right. Um, so what I'm gonna to talk today about is the the influx of the 4G, 5G cellular technologies into the um, Industry 4.0 arena and how it's going to impact um, the future of, of, of industry in general. Um, my background is in doing the development of this technology for more years than I, I care to say, <laughs> and uh, um, have been involved with both startup companies and large companies developing the um, cellular technologies and uh, microwave and millimeter wave technologies that are utilized for developing networking in both uh, long distance communications and in industrial environments. Um, and so what I, what I really wanna do is just jump in and, and give you folks the, the key characteristics that are making this technology interesting uh, fundamentally, the increased data capacity and voice capacity of 5G over 4G is a fundamental change in how this technology compares with what your existing cell phones do and what you're used to in the, um, in, in the commercial environment, certainly. Uh, the, the other big change is in what's called latency, which is the, the rate at which data which is produced at a remote terminal gets communicated to a, uh, a server or some kind of device at, at the network edge. And one of the big things that 5G brings to the party is reducing that latency by essentially a factor of five to 10 over what you're used to seeing in the 4G world. Now for voice communications, this is not that significant an issue but for data communications, it is a critical element and is actually one of the drivers for why 5G is turning out to be so important. It's because low latency communications drives kinds of uh, service levels and capabilities that simply are not possible using other networking technologies. And so this is a critical element and will be driving a lot of what people end up utilizing 5G networks for. Um, the other thing kind of along that same lines is this concept of dedicated capacity. In other words, if you have a, 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 a large environment with hundreds of devices, if not thousands out there, the, the desire is that you want to have those communicating in real time with very low setup costs. And so the advantage of the 5G technology is, is that not only does it provide this low latency capability, but it provides very low um, transition time such that devices can maintain connectivity for long periods of time and maintain that low latency. So that kind of they come together, but they are both critical aspects of why 5G technology. And then in the future, there's uh, this concept of location services built right into the 5G platform such that if you have a high density of devices that you can know exactly where they are in an environment. And that's a technology that is essentially being rolled into 5G technology as well. And, um, and we'll see capabilities moving forward. 
um, the, the one of the fundamental questions comes for in the in industry for 4.0 is how does this compare with Wi-Fi? So Wi-Fi networks are ubiquitous. We have them all in our homes. We have them in our businesses. We have them on the manufacturing floor, and that's not going to go away. The real interesting question for us has been, if you're in an environment with, with Wi-Fi, where do these advanced cellular technologies play? And one way that they play very significantly is, is that cellular technologies typically have a much larger range. So when you're putting out uh, cellular technology uh, infrastructure, they can cover a much larger area with fewer access points than you would normally see in a Wi-Fi deployment. Um, but the more important and interesting aspect of it is, is that the latency and delays that I mentioned in the prior slide actually apply as you're moving through large industrial facilities. So what ends up happening is, is that if you have robots or IoT devices or carts that have been integrated in with these networks, as you move through a large facility and you're moving from radio node to radio node, you still maintain this low level uh, or the low latency communication, which is a fundamental difference between how the Wi-Fi systems work and is a, a major driver for why 4G, 5G technology is showing up as a critical next generation networking technology. Because if you have an environment where you have lots of, of pick and place, for example, machines or, or robotic control systems, this low latency is a critical aspect of ensuring that these networks or these devices work correctly. And, uh, and that's why it is these networks are becoming so critically important. Um, another fundamental aspect is, is that, that cellular systems almost by definition have much better security built into them than Wi-Fi networks. And so in particular, the 4G, 5G technologies are of significant, significantly better security environments than Wi-Fi networks. And that is a critical aspect of, of networks as they're being deployed um, in, in, in commercial industrial environments. There is this movement from what are called public networks to private networks. Um, there is the public network movement to both high frequency, what are called plus 20 gigahertz technologies and low band, low band technologies in the sub gigahertz range. And many of us read about that almost every day, how Verizon and, cellular and, and uh, other uh, cellular companies are deploying in these higher bands um, for providing uh, general services across uh, public environments. Um, compared to that, what we've got going on here is that in private cellular, uh, typically, we're using lower bands in the 3.5 gigahertz range. This is something that has only been allocated and licensed in the last year or so. Other countries have had this capability for a while longer, but essentially we are now in the position where we can deploy these private cellular networks. And this is also what's driving the significant interest in this technology now, as opposed to uh, the Wi-Fi technology, certainly and the desire for folks to have private networks that are not connected in to the public cellular infrastructure that you know, we're very familiar with today. Uh, this is just kind of an overview of all of the different applications that we have seen in both indoor and outdoor private cellular opportunities. Um, it's, they're, they're, they're quite broad, everything from construction location services and monitoring services to environmental control, real-time management, uh, stocking and location and process monitoring, uh, container and ship management, and uh, in the oil and minerals um, uh, industries, processing monitor both infield and offshore. And the, the range of applications is really quite broad. Basically, anything that had been potentially opportunities in the Wi-Fi domain, but were limited because of movement issues and low latency issues really are being addressed head on by the, this new 5G cellular technologies.
uh, most people are interested in just understanding a little bit about how this stuff gets deployed. So for in-building opportunities, you know, basically it looks a lot like what a Wi-Fi deployment might look like, except for the, the range of the radio access points is significantly larger. So, you know, a 10,000 square foot coverage area per radio node is very common. And similar to the Wi-Fi systems, you know, you put out a, a, a number of these radio units in, to cover a large area. What is, what is different, however, is that in all of these cellular networks, there is a concept of a services node or a controller that maintains that connectivity as devices are moving in between the different radio nodes. And that is a critical distinguishing characteristic of the cellular systems as opposed to Wi-Fi in that they always have these kind of cellular uh, systems for, for management of the entire system as opposed to each individual node kind of operating independently. Um, there's a timing requirement that comes with these services nodes. But more importantly, the enterprise application server is also typically located at, the, at the, the, this, this kind of network central point. And um, so what you end up seeing is, is that, that you know, a, a, a large 100,000 to 500,000 square foot industrial facility will have one of these infrastructures put in place, and then there'll be a, a network infrastructure uh, services node, and then network applications that are co-located in services node that are sitting at that same exact spot. So um, someone mentioned, asked this question, when you talk about environmental control, you mean HVAC? That's, that's a perfect example of that. Um, heating and cooling um, is, is a common need and having it deployed, utilizing technology that is not in the same band or utilizing the same facilities as the Wi-Fi networks that are being deployed for, for other applications is critical. So oftentimes we'll get discussions with folks that are either building out uh, environmental controls inside an infrastructure, or quite frankly, the manufacturers of those environmental controls are interested in these kinds of technologies because they can deploy them as part of their own deployments and keep them completely separate from whatever else is going on inside of buildings. Let's see now. Um, this is just a kind of an overview. I'm not gonna spend a lot of time on this, but these are basically any kind of, of cellular device that you're used to seeing in a, uh, uh, any kind of both public and private network can be supported by these 4G, 5G networks. And you can imagine the range of, of applications uh, just taking a look at that. Um, this also technology applies for wireless ISP and farming applications. This is just kind of an example picture of how you know, these kinds of, of networks are architected. Um, you'll set up a tower and then you'll have a coverage area and then you'll basically have maps that are defining kind of how far these, uh, the radio signals go. This is exactly the kind of technology that's used for public network uh, cellular deployment planning, uh, except for in this case, it's being done for the purposes of a private enterprise application, either for a wireless ISP or farming application. Uh, but fundamentally the same kind of network technology and planning tools are used, but they're being done for these private environments rather than public. So there's a whole range of different applications I've kind of spoke to a little earlier, but in because this technology actually was already out there in the field in, um, uh, in, in outside of the United States, you know, there's been a wide range of deployments that have already been done for, for standard kind of coverage areas. In the US, there's been some example applications that have been done, but frankly, the applications are only now getting started and, and companies like ours obviously are focused on providing these kinds of capabilities into the private network environment. So this is really what we do. We work with companies that are either deploying this technology in their infrastructure or companies that are developing technology that depend on low latency and you know, non-Wi-Fi technology-based communications. 
and we provide kind of the whole gamut of services from the integration of these technologies into their into their platforms, uh, the deployment of the technology in environments, and then the management required to keep these networks operating and running long term. And that's it for me. Thanks, Stephen. Uh, very helpful. It's you know after we we get bombarded uh, hourly on uh, with AT and T and Verizon five G you know marketing. It's good to hear the kind of the other side of the story of, the, let me tell you what's really important about, uh, you know, not just industrial, but the fact that it could be a private network uh, owned by the company. Uh, to me, that's very, uh, very important. So we are going to move to John next. Can you come up, John, please? Oh, good afternoon, everybody. Can you hear me okay? Can hear you, but I uh, can't see you. Can hear you, can't see you. And are you pushing slides yet? Yes, I am. All right, I'll let you know when they come up. Got your video. Don't see any slides yet. Okay, I'll try to screen share again. Okay. There we go. Thank you. Okay. Well, good afternoon, everybody. I'd like to start by uh, thanking Keith for the invitation to participate and to uh, Van and Trey for hosting the event. Um, my name is John Powell and I'm a substation engineer with Greenville Utilities Commission here in Greenville, North Carolina. and. Um, uh, my responsibilities that are pertinent to our discussion today are uh, SCADA network administration and uh, SCADA integrations. I've got uh, 20 years of experience in the electric utility industry, and I have previous uh, career experience in manufacturing with Procter & Gamble. Um, so here's our fun fact screen. Uh, Greenwood Utilities, or GEC, is a multi-commodity utility. We have water, wastewater, gas, and electric. Um, and uh, we're also a regional utility provider, meaning that we not only service customers as our endpoints, but also other water systems and uh, other municipalities as well. Um, at heart, we operate as a municipal utility and we regard our customers as our neighbors and our friends. Um, in addition to uh, multiple plant sites, we maintain and operate thousands of miles of power lines and pipelines, and we impact the quality of life of our neighbors, you know, almost every minute of every day. And as far as the electric system, uh, just for some size comparisons, we are the second largest municipal electric system in the state and the 43rd largest in the country. So when it comes to infrastructure, um, we've got over a century of experience uh, building it and maintaining it. Uh, and the questions that beg to be asked today are, you know, with all of these miles of pipelines and power lines, how does GUC monitor and maintain them? Um, also, what cybersecurity challenges does GUC face and what are we doing to meet those? And what technologies are likely to be embraced uh, that are similar to Industry 4.0? So the foundational element uh, to answer these questions is found in an acronym uh, called SCADA. And SCADA stands for Supervisory Control and Data Acquisition. So all four of our utilities use SCADA to monitor our infrastructure. And this is from the plant environment all the way out to our most remote assets out in the field. And in order for SCADA to have such a far reach, we have to build and maintain a very large network. Um, and so whether we're monitoring the state of our power distribution or we're monitoring pressures on gas pipelines, uh, water tank levels for our water supply, or the process of uh, cleaning the water at our wastewater treatment plant. SCADA is the mechanism that gives us visibility into all of our assets and helps us maintain control of all these systems. So SCADA is a rather mature technology. Um, it's been around since the 70s uh, here at Greenwood Utilities. Um, uh, because it's far reaching and integrates with almost all of our operational assets, 
it provides a really good point uh, for us to integrate other systems and use that as a springboard into newer technology. Um, unfortunately, the new technology comes with some risks uh, in addition to the rewards it brings. Uh, chief among those risks is cybersecurity. Uh, many of you have probably seen in the headlines from earlier this month that a hacker boosts toxic chemical level 100 fold at a water plant. Uh, this is an attack that happened down in Florida, and um, uh, it's gotten some, some headlines, uh, mainly because I think uh, nothing really came of it. But the potential for a large scale um, tragedy existed with this hack. Um, so to kind of understand the cybersecurity risk associated with utilities, uh, you got to first understand our posture or where we are now in regards to our history. Um, 20 years ago, each SCADA network for each department was distinct, not only in, in its equipment and its location and the protocols it used, but the people operating it and their daily practices. Um, uh, our SCADA networks had very little involvement from the IT department when they were in their infancy. And most of that's because the best practice at that time was to air gap all of the networks. So the distinction from IT was necessary to a, to a large degree. Over time, there's been some convergence between the IT and OT networks, but it's been, been limited to a degree. Um, now on the OT side, we're challenged with providing a secure network environment. And uh, while OT experts, are, while, while OT people are experts in many areas, very few have the training, expertise, and experience to be cybersecurity experts. Uh, one significant hurdle to the IT-OT convergence is the way IT and OT professionals see problems and solutions. While there's a different mindset between IT and OT, we stand to learn a lot from each other. And one of the more newer, one of the newer, more significant challenges we face is uh, managing the change for our personnel. Um, convincing your workforce that moving from a eight digit password to a 14 digit password uh, is necessary, but it can be difficult. Convincing them that multi-factor authentication is crucial can be a, a pretty long process. It's necessary to train and educate your workforce regarding the whys of these new cybersecurity policies in order to get good buy-in from them. So what has Greenville Utilities been doing about uh, managing the people process part of, of cybersecurity? In 2013, GUC created a group uh, to begin the process of aligning the goals, standards, and strategies of all the various OT systems with our IT department. So now when possible, we, we leverage the same vendors on equipment, such as data radios and ethernet switches. Uh, we leverage our fiber network for the benefit of all departments, uh, even though the majority of it was initially put in by the electric department. Um, we work together on writing specifications for SCADA providers and equipment, and we develop best practices that can be applied across uh, all of the department SCADA systems. Um, as we move into the future, the best path forward um, to mitigate the cybersecurity threat is to have some level, a correct level, uh, you know, a purposeful level of IT and OT convergence. Um, I, I believe it's time for the engineers in the OT world to begin to ask the IT professionals for, for help uh, regarding cybersecurity. Um, I, I must mention though, that the level of convergence must be managed so that the convergence doesn't become its own risk. Um, here at GC, we have established work groups between OT and IT professionals for this very purpose of having a good mutual understanding and developing that path forward together uh, to eliminate these risks. In 2014, our leadership requested the creation of a task force to address cybersecurity, not as an IT or an OT issue, but as a company-wide initiative. Um, uh, this initiative included mandatory training, policy creation, and enforcement. And we are tackling the convergence of IT and OT head on. And I, I'm glad that we're continually making strides in our efforts to reduce our risk. Um, this task force does have uh, representatives from IT, OT, uh, finance, risk management, uh, and HR departments. Uh, we have great support from our uh, uh, chief executive officer and general manager in the implementation of these new policies. And uh, we continue to make uh, significant strides. It's a lot of work. Uh, there's no doubt about that, but it's work that we can't afford to neglect. Okay, as we move into the future, there's some technology that we're uh, looking at implementing here at Green Utilities. Uh, the first one of these is a 
is a SIM solution uh, for an OT network. And while uh, SIMs have been popular for IT networks for some time, uh, deploying them on an OT network is a little different. Um, fortunately, now the technology is available to coordinate the operational data we get from SCADA with security data that we can get from a SIM. And this will give us some, some, some visibility into our network. So currently, if a piece of equipment malfunctions, you know, we can drill down into the operational data and we can look at it and try to determine the cause. If it's a cyber event, we may not be aware of it because we're just looking at operational data. Um, by layering the security data that we can get from a SIM on top of the operational data we can get from SCADA, we can tell if the event was a natural event or the result of a cyber event. So here's a for instance. Um, earlier this month, I, I've already spoken about the attack on the, on the water treatment facility in Florida. And we're, they were really lucky because by chance, the operator saw the hacker moving his mouse um, across the screen. And he saw the hacker change the, the, the values on SCADA for the chemical. Uh, but what if the operator had been busy responding to another event? You know, he might have missed it altogether. The cyber attack could have gone completely undetected. Um, but by using a SIM, the remote login could have been tracked along with the change in value or the control sent over the SCADA system. A simple rule could be put in place to alarm whenever remote logins change values on SCADA. Um, this would have immediately been detected, uh, uh, enunciated, and it could have alerted the operator. And so rather than catching the hacker by mere coincidence or just by chance, they could have been really proactive in their method of detection. So another, uh, another uh, technology that's probably been reluctant to be embraced by utilities is cloud computing. Um, and one of the reasons is in OT networks and process control, uh, there's real world uh, effects for anything that goes wrong on your network. Um, so utilities have been a little bit reluctant to embrace the cloud computing in, in the process control area. However, I believe that as utilities continue to, uh, continue to collect more and more data, I think you're going to see a migration to cloud computing for analytics and storage. Um, so I, I think cloud computing is on the horizon for utilities, but I, I think uh, they're, they're probably just waiting for uh, to see other people do it. They're, they're waiting for the, the first person to take that step. Um, also, uh, I believe that, that, that there's going to be some machine learning uh, to have a, a pretty good sized role in the industry. Um, so for the electric department, we model our system using software in order to, to perform engineering analysis. Uh, water and gas, they do the same thing. I believe we'll begin to see uh, artificial intelligence, machine learning, perform comparisons between our modeled systems and the real-time data that we bring back over SCADA. I think this will give the, the, the machine learning an ability to detect anomalies in our model and recommend you know, some corrective actions. Um, I also believe we'll have uh, OT and perhaps IT dashboards in our control rooms. Not only will operators monitor pipe pressures, tank levels, and voltages, but they'll be uh, looking for real-time cyber threat levels, cyber attacks, failed login attempts, and the like in real time. Um, I think this will give us some, some visibility that we don't currently have uh, and, and enable us to perhaps provide a quicker response to any kind of cyber event that may happen. Uh, this is my contact informa information if needed. Uh, I'd just like to thank everybody for uh, their time and attendance. Thanks, John. Uh, I appreciate you sharing some really fascinating insights uh, to your world. And, uh, you know, we all, we all depend on all of those services, like I said, 24 seven, and not a lot of folks understand what, what goes into those. So uh, appreciate y'all, all your efforts and, and kind of boiling it down so that uh, we can all understand uh, the challenges and the, uh, and the impacts of uh, what it takes to, to monitor and manage those systems. Um, modeling is a really good uh, segue to our next guest, uh, Matt Zimmerman at Beast Code. So I'll turn it over to Matt. Hey, what's up, guys? My name is Matt Zimmerman. I'm the CEO at Beast Code. I have a software engineering background. I'm a huge nerd, and uh, I focused my career on digital transformation over the last 10 years. 
Um, and what that means is being able to work with different organizations and take their data, which is often disparate and has tons of gaps in it, and converting that into 3D interactive data. And we're gonna show you some of that product today. Um, before we get started, um, a little bit about our journey. Uh, when we started our company in 2014, we were seven dudes and we had a foldout table um, and we just started programming. The first thing that we were building was a analysis app uh, for live fire test and evaluation where we had a, a model of a ship uh, and we were working with different warfare centers to get blast data and fragmentation and shock and aggregate that together. And we had 16,000 different hit points on that ship. And because of the level of detail that we're able to model these, we call them a, as a digital twin, which is a, a very broad term in industry. Um, but for us, it's a 3D interactive living, breathing representation of a, of a weapon system or a data center or a power grid or an assembly line. Um, in this case, it was a ship. Uh, so when the, that missile hits and in the, in the simulation, we're able to figure out all the things that are damaged and what are all the downstream effects of that? And is that ship able to uh, continue doing its mission? And as a result of that, we came up with 30 plus different design changes uh, that made the ship more survivable. And from there, uh, we took that analysis app and we turned it into game-based training so that the warfighter who was sitting through hundreds of hours of PowerPoints was able to actually have a game-based environment where they could actually walk around and again, use that living, breathing representation of their weapon system uh, and have familiarization of it and uh, actually operate it and maintain it. And that really turned into doing day-to-day -day logistics. And, and today, the product that I'm about to show you is being used across the Navy Enterprise uh, to support uh, everything from designing new weapon systems to training the workforce that's gonna build them and has to operate them. Uh, and then just translating down to their their day to day jobs, and you know, just keeping the back of your mind like a high level um, idea uh, of how this works is kind of like when you're at home and your dishwasher breaks, you go on Google and it gives you all the answers that you need. It's the same type of capability that we're we're given the warfighter. So I'm just going to share my screen and go over this for five minutes with you guys. All right some of these. Um, all of our products are completely web-based. So this uh, you know, works in a cloud, it works on a local server, um, and I'm also running it off of my tablet. So you can imagine somebody that's in a machinery room or uh, maybe we're, we're modeling like a, a 5G network and we're out in the middle of a field, um, you know, having this you know, resident on your device with all the data that you need. Um, running it in a full screen Google Chrome, first thing I get is a list of what do you want to look at? In this case, we're gonna show you uh, a spaceship that we built and we're gonna bring in all the systems. These systems are all based on CAD models. Um, so we work with shipyards and OEMs and manufacturers to get this type of data, um, but it really only works for uh, new, new platforms. Um, anything that was maybe built 2015 and uh, you know, newer has this type of data. Everything be before that, is actually reliant on like 2D documentation or has some very simplistic CAD model. So we have some really cool machine learning algorithms that can process uh, schematics and blueprints just like humans do and start creating these 3D environments to this level of detail that we're showing today. It's all game-based controls. Uh, so anyone that's ever played, you know, a racing game, shooting game or anything like that can just pick this up and start working with it. Every one of the components in here is fully interactive. And I can pull up different types of information about all of these. One of the biggest use cases we run into is this troubleshooting. The amount of time people spend, uh, you know, walking to uh, the actual thing that they need to maintain or troubleshoot um, to understand what the problem is, and going back to their office or, or wherever their tech docs are stored to find the paper documentation that they need to go through. Um, going back through that, going back to weapon system, back and forth, and back and forth. People spend hours every day just locating the data that they need. And with our product, they can simply click on it and it has all the configuration data, all the parts data, all the serial numbers, things that they would need uh, to do their day-to-day -day jobs. This integrates with uh, product lifecycle management programs uh, that store that type of data. And it also links with things like condition-based maintenance and predictive analytics, uh, like was talked about in a few of the other presentations, being able to use this data uh, to analyze like real-time sensor readings so that we can identify when things are gonna fail and notify the correct people. 
right now, all of these uh, system colors in here uh, are just based on like uh, different colors of pipes, you know, differentiating what the different systems are. Uh, but because it is living and breathing, uh, every one of these components has behaviors behind it. So we can change to what we call static flow. And that really just shows the alignment. Everything that is blue is on and operating, getting all of its support services. Everything that's yellow is off or closed. And you end up getting this white color uh, where we close these valves and indicate that there's no flow to show what the alignment is. And none of this is like pre-processed in a database somewhere. We can actually click on any of these components and change the states of it. So we'll change the state of uh, this valve. And we can see exactly immediately what effect that has on all the fluid systems, the power systems, the network systems, air systems. Um, and in this case, it's a small example that we're showing for the demo. But when you're looking at something like an aircraft or um, an aircraft carrier that's the size of a city, um, or you know, a data center that's miles long, a refinery oil rig, um, you're getting that same type of responsiveness. And this is where people get really excited because from like a maintenance perspective, being able to see what happens when I change the state of something, or if I need to ensure that there's no electricity going to something, having this as a decision aid to be able to support those things are, are done today just with 2D documentation. Um, being able just to speed up all that and to be able to optimize the decisions that are going to be made. The other cool thing is linkages to all the tech manuals. So we showed flat data before, but also being able to access all the schematics. Again, this is all done with machine learning. So we don't have a dude for every uh, um, weapon system we're working with going through and tagging pages and components to the 3D model. Um, that's all just done with algorithms. Um, it creates these cool hyperlinks so we can click on any of these components and zoom right to them. So you can easily trace out any of these diagrams. And we also have what we call the avatar mode or we can view this from a first person's perspective. So uh, we were looking at all the pipes and the power, um, you know, kind of like x-ray vision looking into the spaceship, uh, but we can also jump right into the spaceship itself or uh, maybe in a hangar, or maybe you're in a data center or in an assembly line um, and be able to view it from a different perspective, but still have all the same data that we were showing you before. We can still pull up different types of information and we still have links to all of the technical documentation uh, that a, a maintainer or troubleshooter would need. And we'd clicked in the schematic that we wanted to view um, the pump and we get this GPS Google map style. Hey, you're in the bridge. This is the fastest route to get to that pump. So you can imagine when you're on something like a, a ship uh, that has thousands of components and you're just looking at a jungle of pipes, um, having something like this is just gold. And from this perspective, being able to communicate um, things that you're going to do, we're going to do a maintenance activity today. So these are all the things we need to go through, or we're going to rip this tank in the back out here, and this is the best path for taking it out. Or we had some type of a casualty, being able to walk back through what happened and how we should have actually reacted to that. But my favorite part about our application is really just how everything's linked together. So this was the pump that we were looking for. I can go back to the tech manuals and uh, pull up that same schematic and jump to the, the next component, which is a valve, and go right back into the 3D viewer. So having a high level visualization of um, the thing that you're working on, all the pipes, all the power, having all the components linked to the data that you need to troubleshoot it and maintain it, having uh, the living, breathing representation of it so you can actually interact with it and see what's gonna happen being able to jump into your schematics and manuals and then into a first person's perspective um, is just a, a crazy capability. And all of it uh, is just residing in your browser. So you don't have to install it anywhere. Your users just go open Google Chrome, go to the correct URL, and you're accessing this data. And that's it. Thank you, guys. Thanks, Matt. Uh, that is, uh, that's eye-watering uh, capability from a guy who used to traipse around in the bilges on ships with uh, tech manuals under his arm and, you know, <laughs> trying to troubleshoot gear uh, along with, with my folks. Um, so I think uh, Scott may not be joining us today. So I think we've, we've really ended uh, our, our speakers portion. So uh, we're moving into the Q&A and, &A and uh, I'd like to open it up to uh, our guest participants uh, to ask 
our speakers some questions. Hey Keith, do you want us to type them in there? I got one about CMMC. Do you just want me to talk about it or type it out? Yeah, I was I was opening that at the same time. I was just looking at that. Um, yeah, can you can you address that with uh, with uh, uh, Mr. Sasser, please? Yeah, absolutely. So CMMC is a big thing um, with the DoD. Um, there's actually new contract requirements where it says you have to be accredited uh, up to level three. Uh, to actually be able to win one of these contracts. Um, we do have a, a DevSecOps environment, um, which includes everything IT, cyber, and then automation of deployment and scanning of all of our tools. Um, so we've actually been working the last couple of years to ensure that we have everything in place for a CMMC. And we're going above and beyond just trying to get to that level three, which is the minimum. Um, and right now, a lot of our um, accreditation is up to level four and five. Um, but, you know, end state for us is, is level five. And for us, I mean, working with all these different weapon systems across the, the DOD, not just the Navy, but with the, the Air Force and other branches, um, one of the biggest things for us is if we got hacked, we'd be done. You know, if, if you know, we were to, we have a ton of credibility um, with how much security we have and how much automation and, and the technology we're building. But um, if we were to uh, get hacked tomorrow, I mean, that would be a huge hit to our credibility. <clears throat> yeah. Thanks, Matt. Um, very informative. I just saw another question from, uh, hang on, it just scrolled on me. Mr. Boyd, I think, asking a Linux question. Kali Linux, he was asking if that's what you were using. Oh, um, so actually, uh, it's agnostic of any type of operating system. So, um, all of our technology is web-based, and then it's containerized, and then those containers are uh, deployable on Windows, Linux, and other different types of operating systems. Um, so one of the big perks with that is, you know, we're not building a, a tool specifically for like a Windows device. We're building it for a, a cloud infrastructure, and, and in, in many of those cases, um, you know, we don't get to determine what that OS is going to be. Uh, but the benefit of working with those cloud architectures is we're inheriting all of their security controls. So as long as our container fits into their environment, um, we're Gucci. Thank you. Oh, I see Van popping up. Um, do you have a question or you want me to keep going? No, I've got a question that I've heard quite often and that is, can our rural manufacturers remain competitive in a 5G industry 4.0 environment? Is uh, let's let's start that one with uh, with Stephen, please. Uh, so the, the the simple answer is absolutely yes. The um, the utilization of 4G, 5G technology actually is ideal in places where you have complete control of your own personal environment. So rural environments actually turn out to be perfect for these applications. And any place where you have kind of an enclosed space where you have control over it is really the ideal for, in, for 4G, 5G technology. So we, we often see folks that own large industrial facilities that are in either on their own property or in industrial parks um, work just fine with this because they can control it themselves and they have the ability to optimize the deployment around their particular needs. Thanks, Stephen. Mm -hmm. uh Hey, John, do you have any uh, comments? I mean, you're about as, uh, you're, you, you have to deal with both an urban and a rural and rural locations across the, uh, the GUC enterprise. Uh, any comments on, on Van's question? Um, well, for us, uh, it, it came down to us uh, building our own fiber network out. Um, and we found out that uh, we weren't the only people that needed it. So uh, we actually lease uh, dark fiber to uh, several different uh, entities in the county. Um, and uh, 
for, for us, that's helped to defray a, a small portion of the cost of putting the fiber in, but, but, but not really. Really, we've leveraged it for our own capabilities, and uh, it, it's been one of the best things we could have done from a communication standpoint. Um, I really think that the rural areas are going to be dependent upon, uh, you know, the telecommunications carriers doing it. And I really think there's going to have to be some uh, really strong lobbying for the government to subsidize it. Um, I just don't think you're going to, uh, I don't think the profit center's there for them to do it by themselves. Uh, so I think, I think they're going to have to be uh, uh, enticed to do it uh, through government subsidies. All right, I see, I, I see Matt is typing uh, some answers in to some of the questions he's getting. Uh, let's see, so you covered Joe's question. I see Mr. Fister, compressed air while vital to manufacturing processes is expensive. Are there software platforms that can map current state and then run a program to remap the pipes to reduce the number of fittings, elbows, et cetera? Um, not sure who to address that one with. Maybe John, I don't know that you deal with compressed air though. Um, we may have to, we may have to uh, take that one for a look up. Unless it's something Matt is familiar with. I can chime in a little bit. I mean, those types of programs do exist. I think a lot of the PLM products, like Siemens products, probably has something that would support that, um, where you could create like a 3D environment and it could optimize, you know, how you would route um, the, those different types of components. And maybe not just compressed air, but I, I've seen that with like uh, electrical. And I, I just think there's, there's a lot of different software components out there. Um, that would do that, that type of routing for you to, to figure out what is the best way. I think you'd find that in, in like CAD software. Thanks, interesting. Uh, Matt, do you want to comment just uh, audibly on uh, Todd Edwards' question uh, and or Joe Gaines' question? Yeah, absolutely. I was, uh, I'll start with Joe Gaines because I was typing that one out. Um, you're talking about uh, the really old Navy systems and a lot of them are like 50 years old and that's really the fun part. I mean, we get um, tech manuals that have been scanned and scanned and scanned and they got coffee stains and donut stains on them from the from the 80s, right? And um, part of the magic is our machine learning software that can process that information for us and it can tell us how components are interconnected and then pull all the tabular data out and aggregate all that stuff together. Um, we're able to create environments of uh, digital twins for, for a really old weapon system in like three to six months, probably less than that. And a lot of that's due to the cool process that we have here uh, that's integrated with automation. Uh, and part of our challenge is taking all of that old documentation and getting it up to date so that we do actually have CAD models and then we can get those into like a PLM environment where they can be modified. Um, Todd. Todd Edwards is talking about uh, expected life of parts and, and given systems. Um, I just, I, I categorize it as like digital engineering. Once we create these 3D environments, there's things that OEMs are charging tens of millions of dollars today to do that can be replaced with a simple script. So something like expected life parts that can be done with a simulation that can be done by querying a database or even just writing a, a simple script uh, to, to do those types of calculations for you. Awesome. Awesome. Uh, the Navy is lucky to have uh, Beast Code on the on the hunt uh, doing that. I'm going to shift gears a little bit uh, because I see some uh, some education flavor in, in one of the questions. I want to give Harry some time. I know that uh, as part of our Golden Leaf, we originally had some K through 12 uh, STEM initiatives built in, and then we kind of skinned it down a little bit. Uh, and he didn't really go into that uh, as much today as, as with our community college partners and our, uh, our efforts on campus in, in, uh, at ECU. But I wanna give him some time just so he can kind of make the case for regional uh, K through 12 and any other connections that he wants to make because I see some, some chatter going on in the, uh, in the chat box. Sure, I mean, <clears throat> I began by responding to Andrew Harris who's out 
uh, with a charter school in Elizabeth City about you know, struggling with finding industry advice, uh, feedback and direction on knowing what certifications employers and colleges are looking for. And I, I told him in the chat, you know, email me and we'll, we'll connect him with at least some of the folks here who, who have an understanding of, of employer desires in, in, in that area. And, and it points to, you know, our strategy for uh, trying to uh, improve the workforce pipelines pathways is a, is a regional one where we really uh, are aiming both in the pharma area and in the advanced manufacturing or smart manufacturing area to have geographically distributed uh, and focused collaborations with community college partners and industry partners in a local region. Um, our approach is a really a grow local approach to sourcing talent uh, locally, uh, uh, educating them locally and regionally, and then, uh, you know, uh, hoping that uh, through uh, their desire to remain in the communities, uh, they're going to remain in in the local community and provide that talent for their local industry, rather than uh, with less likelihood of, of them being drawn to the bright lights of the big city. Um, so, you know, what what we're what we're uh, uh, doing is, in addition to having the BS programs here on campus in Greenville. Uh, working uh, through our BS in Industrial Technology, which is a degree completion program that can be done via distance education, uh, working uh, to be able to reach uh, students in place. Uh, our BSIT program, uh, our community college students who want to remain local and, and our industry partners who are distributed and to be able to provide our continuing education to our uh, industry partners with the employees uh, in place where they are rather than having to have them uh, come to Greenville. Uh, to kind of sum up there, it's the digital transformation of higher education. Uh, all of the equipment in both of the equipment test beds are gonna be inter industry, industrial internet of things connected. And it's, it represents digital transformation of our educational process to be able to reach our um, students uh, at any level in place where they are so that they can actually not just take courses, but uh, do uh, real hands-on uh, engagement with real equipment uh, from a distance. And so that's that's the direction that we're going with that. Keith, I don't know if that's what you wanted me to say or what you were yeah, doing me to yeah. say. That, that's perfect. Thanks, Terry. Um, you know, we're all, we're all passionate about in, engaging our region and uh, and improving opportunities for everybody who, who lives here. And we've got all these wonderful manufacturers, uh, as Van hinted, you know, some of them are fairly rural, uh, but as Stephen reinforced, you know, with these new technologies, that is actually an advantage in a lot of ways uh, for, this, for this industry 4.0 revolution that we're, and I keep hear, hearing people talk about it's coming, but I keep reading about things that indicate, no, it's pretty much here and you better get on board. So it's, it's, I think this is very good, uh, very good timing. Um, you know, it, it's that K through 12 piece is so important. We can, we can help industry find, you know, workforce today, but, but that seed corn starts so early now with uh, so many of our students in the region. Um, and let me, let me chip in on that, Keith, you know, yeah, go ahead. Go ahead, Aaron. it's, it's difficult for us to sort of do K-12 outreach at a distance from a central location. So this regionally geographically coordinated approach with local community colleges to partner with local industry and the local community college to do the K through 12 marketing and outreach in the local schools in, in whatever county we're interacting with. with. Um, that's that's the, the, the best way and the most effective way to reach, reach those uh, students and their families early on to uh, develop that pathway and make them aware of that pathway so that they know step by step how they can get there, whether whether it's graduating from high school and going right to work and continuing their education in a community college while they're employed or uh, or at the other extreme, uh, making a decision to go to to, for example, ECU to be on campus for one of our programs. Yeah, that that flexibility is so important. It's been very encouraging to see. Uh, see what was built for the Eastern Region uh, Pharma Center 
and then what is going to be to come uh, for additional capabilities uh, on campus, but, but connecting those uh, different remote locations around the region, so important. Um, one, more, one more shout out, Keith, you know, to anyone who's on the call, there's, I see 73 participants. So, you know, whether you're a parent or, you know, an employee or an industry leader or an economic developer, you know, there's there's different touch points for us to engage with you and help you. So uh, please, anyone who who would like to have any uh, assistance, no matter where you are and what your situation is, you know, to reach out to us. Perfect. Um, the what what we see from our uh, many of our industry partners is that uh, that they will either provide tuition or tuition reimbursement in some cases. Uh, so that their employees can, can continue on these pathways and making it remote so that they don't have to travel to classes in Greenville is very important. Same for our military partners in the region. We're the largest military personnel footprint east of the Mississippi River. Uh, we're in a phenomenal position uh, and so many, you know, very skilled professionals uh, are right here in our area. And the military, <clears throat> be it the Navy, Marine Corps, Army, Air Force, uh, Coast, Guard, Coast Guard, they all offer tuition assistance uh, through their services. So uh, even while they're in uniform, they can still take some of these courses. In fact, the, the, the bachelor degree in industrial technology that Harry referenced is our, has our largest active duty population taking those courses remotely uh, around the globe. Um, uh, that's the largest active duty population of any ECU program, uh, but they're stationed around the globe and that flexibility and adaptability is, uh, is very uh, helpful uh, to keep them on those pathways. Let's see. Any other questions, Trey? Are you backing me up? Have you seen anything that popped in that we have not addressed yet? I believe all questions have been addressed right now, but there was one question answered by Stephen earlier that I was hoping he'd be able to address live. Stephen, it was a question in regards to 5G and if there were any potential health risks um, in, re related to 5G. And you had an excellent answer to it, so I'd like to address that. Yeah, sure. Um... So we all live in the planet <laughs> and we all have seen a number of folks across the country and across the world uh, basically asking a fundamental question of whether these 4G and 5G technologies are health risks. And it's gotten to the point where groups have formed and people have been you know, trying to burn down towers and all kinds of horrific stuff around, you know, this whole area of, of wireless technology and its impact on, on, on human life. Um, so I guess what I said in, 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 my, in my text response was, look, I've been, I've been working in this industry and developing this technology for my, the vast majority of my career. And that means being up close and personal with wireless transmitters, right, you know, literally on my lab bench working full time in this technology. And also spending many years in school learning about it and becoming an expert in the technology across the board. And although it's not my place to be the be all end all expert in this, I will tell you that the radio frequency characteristics are such that certainly for signals above the 20 gigahertz range, the propagation characteristics, the fundamental electrical magnetic characteristics of radio wave propagation in those bands is such that for the power levels that we're talking about, there is no way that any of those signals could have an impact on your physical well-being. That's just the way that things are designed and the power levels that we're talking about. When you're talking about frequencies below the six gigahertz range, there's no question that there are power levels that can be powerful enough that can actually, I mean, what is a microwave oven but a 2.4 gigahertz 
you know, radio. That's basically what it is. So we know that there are power levels that are in common use that can be of significant power level. And in those domains, that's why we have organizations like the FCC, which are specifically in place to ensure that the power levels that are used in communication are far lower than levels that will impact and you know, impact human life. So I have had the opportunity to go and take a look at the, all the documents that, that people put into the FCC around this. And quite frankly, I am personally convinced that the power levels that are being used for 4G and 5G communication and the way that they are being deployed fit are, are, are factors of 100 below at least, if not thousands below levels that would have an impact on human life. And for that reason, I personally have not been concerned that these levels are high enough that we as a community and as a society should be worried about. I can totally appreciate that there are good reasons for people to be concerned. And that's not to say that, you know, there will always be concern. But the role of an engineer fundamentally is to make sure that the work that they do is helpful, not damaging <laughs> to human life. And uh, as one of that community of people, I would say it is our responsibility to make sure that these systems provide value and do not cause harm. And uh, with that, I would say that we are doing that job and we are, are taking a good responsible perspective on making sure that these systems are well below levels that would have an impact on, on, you know, on, on, on life. Thanks, Stephen. Uh, I don't know if you saw that popped in while you were talking, uh, a question on bean forming game for towers. I know in the Navy on our phased array radars, uh, we use beam forming for uh, tracking all kinds of things, but uh, I'm assuming beam forming gain for cell towers is the specific question from uh, Mr. Reed. Yeah, so, so let, let, me, let me back up and say when, when we are making decisions around power levels, we are not making those decisions based upon the RF power generated by the radio technology itself, the RF power levels that we assess are the actual RF power levels in space around the antenna and at distances away from the antenna. So when you see a specification, it's, it's really including all of the sources of how that energy is being produced. And, and so beamforming is actually a method for essentially concentrating power levels in a specific portion of the space. And the amount of energy in that space, again, is a function of how much RF power is being presented to the antenna and how much concentration the antenna does in terms of how it focuses that energy in one particular area. But in any of these cases, the measurement that is being used and the assessment that is being used is being made outside of the antenna. It's being made at a certain number of meters away from where the antenna itself is and incorporates both the beam forming and the RF power that is being presented to the antenna. So the total power that is being that is being deployed in an environment is what people use for assessing power level. It's not before a beam former or after a beam former, it is total power. And that includes both the RF power being generated by the transmitter and whatever antenna technology is being used as well. It's not, you can't get around the spec of how much RF power is actually in space at some distance away from the antenna source. Wonderful. Thanks, Stephen. 
I saw uh, Ms. Williams just uh, posted a question about uh, SCADA systems. Harry, can you see that question? I think that one uh, is directed to you. Yeah, I'm having a look. I think she's throwing you a softball. Yeah, uh, well, the answer is yes. <laughs> uh, yes, yes, yes. Uh, so we, we certainly are, are involved uh, in uh, SCADA systems. I don't know that we call them that by name, but I certainly have faculty in our Department of Technology Systems who can help. And then we have our colleagues at PCC who we can connect you with. So uh, yes, in terms of uh, these kinds of systems, uh, our, our technology systems faculty are, are all, all over this. Thank you, sir. Okay, uh, Van, it, we are at, I think my time that's been allocated. So I, I wanna thank again, our guests, Harry, uh, Stephen, John, and Matt for taking the time to share some just enlightening points and tying a lot of things together uh, for us. I hope the, the audience uh, feels the same way and you know, potentially we could, we could have a follow-up uh, discussion of this nature uh, in the future. But uh, for now, I'll turn it back over to Van. Well, thank you to all the participants. Thank you for, to the panelists. Um, this has been a great discussion. I think there are a lot of other opportunities that we could have follow-up webinar discussions on. Um, we have another, our next webinar is next week, the future of retail post-COVID. That ought to be another interesting topic that we have. Uh, but particularly thank you to Keith and all the participants for participating today. And I hope you have a good day. Um, take care, thanks, bye-bye.